And uh, so as uh, you remember, uh, the cells in the positive Grassmannian and the non-negative Grassmannian are defined by setting some Plucker coordinates to zero and requiring that the rest are strictly positive. But this set of Plucker coordinates which we set to zero cannot be arbitrary because there are some Plucker relations that impose some restri restrictions to, to this. And we want to define these you know, objects. So let me define, well, next section will be positroids. So by definition, a positroid, so positroid is an abbreviation for positive matroid. So that's uh, a subset, a non-empty subset of k element sets, subset in this n choose k, uh, uh, such that there exists uh, an element uh, of a non-negative Grassmannian uh, such that uh, the elements i is an m if and only if the corresponding Plucker coordinate is strictly positive and it's i is then a complement to n to m so it's n choose k minus m if and only if Plucker coordinates is equal to zero okay so if we can actually find a matrix with all non-negative maximal minors such that this set is exactly the set of all indices of all strictly positive minors, then we call this set as a positroid. And as I said, this M cannot be just an arbitrary subset here. There are some restrictions. First of all, it has to be a matroid. These are like special cases of matroids. I'm not going to define matroids right now, but basically you can think about Matroid as a kind of combinatorial extension of kind of similar definition and you don't require matrix to be totally non-negative. Uh, but Positroid is a, and in general Matroids, it is very hard to describe Matroids. I, I didn't define them, but it's uh, hard to describe them and they have very, in general, complicated structure. But among all these Matroids, we have these special Matroids that correspond to these cells that come from this matrix, totally non-negative matrices, and uh, so by definition, uh, these cells, or well not by definition, but by the theorem that I mentioned in the first lecture, these positroids are in bijection if the cells. So, so theorem, let me rephrase the previous theorem, is that cells in GR in the non-negative Grassmannian are in bijection with positroids. And we are going to denote these cells, actually positroid cells, and we are going to denote, denote them by pi of sub m. Pi sub m will be our notation for the cell that corresponds to m. So again, given such a subset, we are looking at a set of all elements in the Grassmannian that satisfy this condition, and that is a cell. I mean, if this is, if it's non-empty. And we want to kind of describe, that's the definition, but we want to describe this structure more explicitly. So how can we... If, if, you, describe, if you replace non-negative with positive, can you say the same thing? So, where, where... Can you... I mean, if I put... I, if I put strictly positive here, yeah. then by definition M has to be the whole n choose k. So that by definition strictly positive Grassmann is where all minors are strictly positive, then M is this whole set, which is also a positroid, but it's kind of the kind of maximal positroid. And if you want to describe the cells. And the low dimensional cells are given by some subsets here that can be which label all uh, strictly positive uh, Plucker coordinates. Elements of M correspond to all strictly positive Plucker coordinates. Okay. Now, how do, they, how do we explicitly describe them? And uh, in order to describe them, so let me give you a few definitions. Uh, and uh, so next definition 
we're going to say a Grassmann necklace a Grassmann necklace is a sequence uh, j1 dot dot jn so here uh, j_i's are again k element sets of n uh, and they satisfy the following conditions such that for every i uh, j_i plus 1 it's almost the same as j_i it differs only by switching one element so we j_i plus 1 we need to skip element i and add some element j okay and this is not a typo this has to be the same as this okay so we are allowed to skip ith element and add some other element okay and or uh, they can be the same ji plus one can be the same as ji so they either are the same or differ by uh, exactly one element and we the only element we are allowed to skip on the ith step is i and uh, all indices uh, so here i is taken modular m okay so it means that the first element is obtained from the last element again by this kind of uh, switch okay and theorem is that actually positroids are in uh, bijection the Grassmann necklaces these necklaces uh, and let me even describe this bijection explicitly it can be explicitly described in both directions so let me describe so how to give an epositroid how to get a Grassmann necklace which will denote J of M so in uh, so first of all, of all all these J's will be some elements of the epositroid but again positroid lives in this set it has like up to n choose k elements uh, and these are like special n, n elements in the set of like size of n choose k so in general m has a much larger size than m and n uh, okay so first of all j1 is just lexicographically minimal element of m so just order all elements of m of this set in the lexicographical order and take the the first that's j1 and all and the same is true for all other j sub i so it's also lex min element of m but with respect to kind of shifted cyclically shifted lexicographical order so with respect to cyclically shifted ordering so we want to order numbers from 1 up to n not in the usual way but we want to order order them i less than i plus 1 less than i plus 2 dot dot up to n which is less than 1 less than 2 dot dot less than i minus 1 so you take the usual ordering of numbers from 1 to n kind of take its cyclic shift that induce lexicographical order on all subset element subsets and you take the first element of m and claim is that so we have these special elements inside of m and uh, it's a Grassmann necklace and uh, this Grassmann necklace uniquely you can uniquely reconstruct m from this sequence of j's so in a sense these j's are kind of extremal elements and again extremal in this kind of cyclic uh, again, this statement is a little bit similar to the fact that, well, not similar, but analogous to the fact that, for example, if you have a polytope, if you know its extremal points, the vertices, then you can reconstruct all integer points of the polytope from just from the vertices. 
So in a sense, it's kind of similar to this one. So this J1 up to Jn are extremal elements of the positroid, but in this kind of, well, in this form. OK. So we had this Grassmann necklaces, but actually we can even have even more familiar objects associated with these positroids, because these Grassmann necklaces are in bijection leaf permutations. So you can even uh, encode the same structure by permutations. So let me continue here. Lexicographical and minimal is the minimal in uh, like alphabetical order. Like it's like you order numbers from, well, just first like take the, you know, like how would you put them in, uh, you know, list them in uh, alphabet? So for the minimal one, for example, one, two, three, four up to k, the next one, one, two, three, four, skip k, but take k plus one, and so on. So that's the lexicographical order, the most like usual way to list all Kellerman subsets. And you take the first one in this order, and then you shift your labels of your ground set like this, reorder them like this, and also take the shifted, cyclically shifted lexicographical order. And these special elements are enough to reconstruct uh, a positroid. And uh, let me even encode them by a permutation. So definition, uh, like, well, it's a permutation of just a little bit more structure. We call it a decorated, decorated permutation. Well, W, that's a permutation of n letters in a sen, uh, with fixed points, points, so points such that wi equals to i, color it in two colors, say black and white, or like pick your two favorite colors. OK. And these decorated permutations, uh, Actually, also, I think Jake mentioned affine permutations. They're basically the same objects, just kind of slightly different. Uh, OK. And uh, these necklaces are in bijection with decorated permutations. Uh, so lemma, so Grassmann necklaces are in bijection with decorated permutations. And this bijection is given by uh, as follows. So j1 dot dot, dot jn, so if we have this necklace, it corresponds to permutation w such that, so if ji plus 1 equals to ji minus i union with j, then w of i equals to j. Right, so this permutation just tells you like how this switches, like then you go from i to jth element, you need to switch one element, and this permutation just tells you exactly which element is switched to this. So, okay, but where this coloring is coming from? Coloring is coming from fixed points, but there are kind of two types of fixed points in this situation. So because, uh, well, two types of fixed points, so one possibility is that j i plus 1 can be equal to j i, and both of them contain i. That's one possibility. Another possibility, and then we have a fixed point in this permutation, if, if j i plus 1 equals to j i, and they don't contain i. Okay? And depending, and both of them correspond to the same fixed point, w of i equals to i, but we will call all of them in like black and white according to which of these situations occur. And this decorated permutation, again, uniquely determine Grassmann necklace, and it's uniquely determined the positroid. And I mean, in the write-up that's on the web page, there are like explicit bijections in all directions. But anyway, so really everything is determined by permutation with this kind of little bit extra structure of coloring fixed points. So let me give you a simple example. Very simple example, just to clarify how this works. 
Uh, okay. Let me pick a point in uh, in the Grassmannian uh, two four. Oh, okay. So it is given by the following matrix: one zero zero one. Negative one, one, negative one, one. So it belongs to the Grassmannian GR, no negative Grassmannian two four. And again, the columns. So if you call these columns of this matrix by uh, their two dimensional vectors, v one up to v four. So they look like this. So v one is this vector, v two is this vector, v three is this vector. And it's equal, and the four is also the same vector before. So basically, if you have a, in a two, in the case of Grassmannian two n, uh, this two by n matrix represent a point in the non-negative Grassmannian. If these vectors are arranged in this kind of counterclockwise order on the plane, except that we kind of allow, you know, repeated vectors. If we have a, in this case, we have a kind of some low-dimensional cell. And now, if you look at all minors, two by two minors of this matrix, uh, so almost all of them will be strictly positive, up to delta one, uh, to delta one, three, and so on. All of them are strictly positive, except the last one, delta three four equals to zero. And all other totally, all other two by two minors are strictly positive. So that means that the corresponding positroid M will be all two element subsets for choose two, except except uh, three four. Okay. Now what are, what are, what is the necklace? What is the corresponding uh, Grassmann necklace? So. First, J1 should be, oh, okay, I'm just erasing definition and I'm replacing it by example. So, J1 is what? It's uh, just lexicographical minimal, I mean, it's just 1, 2. So, J2 is now, can you tell me what's the J2? Now, the lexicographical minimal, I mean, it should be 2, 3, right? It's 2, 3. So J3 is, uh, uh, well, we cannot take 3, 4, right? Because 3, 4 is 0. So you skip 3, 4, but uh, then in it's 3, one, three. three one, or which is the same as 1, 3. And J4 is, uh, again, the electric first element should be 4, 1. And it is inside of our positroid, it's 4, 1, or 1, 4. And you see, you kind of see why I call it a necklace, because it looks like, you know, a necklace. Uh, okay, now what's the corresponding permutation? So that's the necklace. So how we encode this by permutation? So the W, in this case, you see how you, like, then you go from here to here, you skip one and replace it by three. So it sends one to three. When you go from here to here, you skip two and replace it by one. So two goes to one. Then you go from here to here, you skip three and replace it by four. Three goes to four. And then you go from here to here, you skip four and replace it by two. Four goes to two. So that's the permutation, or we can even represent it by a diagram. Uh, one, two, three, four. One goes to three. Two goes to one. Three goes to four. Four goes to two. Okay. So that's, and this diagram uniquely determined, well, in this case, we don't have any fixed points, we don't need to have any decorations, but basically this diagram uniquely, well, in this case, it's pretty obvious, like positroid is almost the same thing as necklace, just one more element, but in general, again, this necklace have only n elements and positroid might have a lot more elements, but you can reconstruct them just from this permutation uniquely. Okay. Next thing. So next I'm going to discuss, uh, well, Grassmannian graphs. What kind of graphs we are dealing with. 
So we want to you know, describe these objects, these positroids and positroid cells, parameterize them by graphs. So now let me actually define these graphs for you. Uh, so, okay. So these graphs, final graphs, will be some generalization of playback graphs that we discussed before. So, graphs, Manian graphs. They are going to be graphs drawn on, well, instead of writing it down, let me just draw, show you an example. They are going to be graphs drawn on the plane. Uh, well, something like, basically arbitrary graphs drawn on the plane, undirected graphs, okay. Okay, that is a typical Grassmannian graph, okay. And they have n boundary vertices, uh, B1, B2, B3, order it in a clockwise, a clockwise order up to, in this case, like Bn, n equals to 7. And we need a little bit extra structure. So for each vertex, so each internal vertex has one parameter, each internal vertex has a parameter which we call helicity. So h of, well, each vertex v has helicity h of v, which is just a number between 0 and the degree of the vertex. So for each vertex, I'm going to put some number. I, I don't know, maybe 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1. Just some number between 0 and the degree. Okay, and let's call it helicity. Uh, okay, now for graphical purposes, I'm going to represent these helicities by colors. So if helicity equals to 1, I'm going to make it a white vertex. White vertices is just in a, instead of writing this number, I'm going to just. So for example, all ones will be represented by white vertices. But again, colors are just kind of another. Graphical notation for helicity. If helicity equals to degree minus one, I'm going to represent it by black. Okay, so three is four minus one, so this is black vertex. This is uh, do I have any? This is also black vertex. Uh, and uh, now, so this vertex is neither white and black. I mean, I should use a grayscale, or I know should invent. Oh, this is also black. So, and here I, I can kind of represent it by like a BMW sign. So, something, something between black and white. Okay, so, so we have this kind of graph, and that's a Grassmannian graph. Uh, okay, now I want to define a perfect orientation of graphs. So, a perfect orientation, so a priori, so these graphs have no any orientations, no errors. But now we are going to consider certain ways to put errors on the edges that satisfy some rules. Like a perfect orientation of G, so Grassmannian graph, well, G is going to be a graph, uh, uh, and we are going to denote this orientation by letter O, uh, is a way to put errors, so is an orientation such that for every vertex v, so for every vertex v, exactly h of v edges are oriented in. Right, so for every vertex, some of the edges adjacent to this vertex are oriented towards this vertex, some of the edges are oriented out. So for each vertex, 
I want it, so exactly h of v ad, uh, adjacent edges are oriented in towards this vertex. OK, let me give you an example of a perfect orientation. Now I want to put arrows on the edges in any way. And the only condition is that if I see vertex of helicity 1, I want one edge to be in, and the rest should be out. So here I should have two edges, two in, two out. So maybe something like this, these two in, these two out, uh, and so on. So this here should be one in, two out. So maybe like this. So here should be two in, one out, maybe like this. So here should be three in, one out. So maybe this is in, 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 this is out, uh, and, uh, and so on. Okay, so that's a perfect orientation. Now the, one, the last one needs to be out. Should be. The last one you drew. Okay, so it should be two in, two out. They oh. The leg. You already have two in. There are three in. No, you want that one. Okay, so this, yeah, should be out. Okay. Okay, that's, that's the rule. So that's a perfect orientation. And uh, now we have uh, what I called, since we are like in physics audience, I want to have some pseudo-physical terminology. Uh, so I'll call it helicity conservation law. <laughs> so what helicity conservation law says is that any for any, so first of all, we are going to work only with perfectly orientable graphs. Not any graph will be, have a perfect orientation, but we only care about graphs that have perfect orientations. So, uh, so for any, for any perfect orientation of G, uh, has well maybe maybe any. Like maybe not any. All perfect orientations of G have the same number of boundary edges oriented in. Okay. Now I'm looking at directions of, the, and we call this bound, this number helicity of the whole graph. Uh, we called, we denote it by, call it helicity, and we denote it by uh, h of helicity of the whole graph, h of g. So for example, in this case, we're looking at all boundary edges, and we have this is in, in, out, in, out, in, out. So we have one, two, three, four. So in this case, helicity of this whole graph equals to four. And if you take any, that's actually not hard to prove, that's pretty easy claim, but if you take any other perfect orientations, you should also get exactly the same number four. So moreover, this number is given by the formula. Uh, so let me give you a formula for this helicity. So if you take helicity of G, so it's a number between zero and N. Number of boundary edges, if you kind of center it around N, so if you kind of shift it by N minus two, so instead of, so kind of make it between minus n over 2 and plus n over 2. So this quantity should be the sum over all internal vertices uh, of helicities of vertices uh, also kind of centered, shifted, uh, so minus degree of v over 2. So these kind of shifted helicities kind of add up, like helicity of the graph, I mean, if you denote this expression by h tilde, then h tilde for g is the sum of h tildes for uh, all vertices. And again, that's not terribly hard to prove. And uh, next thing, so now we know like for any perfect orientation, they have the same number of boundary edges oriented in. Let us denote this subset of boundary edges oriented in by i of O. Uh, 
uh, denote I of O, so that's K, well, it is N choose H of G, well, oh, maybe I should say N choose K, element, K element subset of N, where K is the helicity of the graph. Uh, the set of labels of boundary edges oriented in. So again, in this example, this for this perfect orientation, I of O equals to what? One three uh, one three four five five six seven one three seven five seven okay now next thing is theorem let me tell you how these Grassmann graphs are related to positroids so I actually before I do it let me denote m of g the set of all possible I of O subsets over the boundary edges oriented in for all perfect orientations. Okay, so you take set of all perfect orientations from the graph and take the set of boundary edges oriented in, and theorem is that M of G is a positroid. And any positroid has this form. So, like for any positroid, we can find a graph such that m equals to the positroid corresponding to this graph. So we get a whole list of positroids. So for any any graph like this, gives you a positroid, and we get a complete list. And again, just to give you an example, oh, actually, that's going to be the same example here. I don't want to erase it. Oh, okay, I can do it here. Use this part. Uh, so let me take this graph. So this is B1, B2, B3, B4. Now we are looking at all possible perfect orientations of this graph and there are going to be how many perfect orientations? Uh, there will be exactly five. One is uh, like this, another one is like this, then uh, another one is like this, another one is, so we have five possible perfect orientations, mm. and one is, okay, Okay, so this is white, 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 black, 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 black. And for each of these orientations, we will record the indices of the boundary edges oriented in. So this perfect orientation gives you a subset 1, 4. So let me just write it 1, 4. This perfect orientation gives me the subset. Uh, 1, 2 is out, 3, this one, uh, 2, 3, 4, 2, 4, and this one gives me 2, 3. Okay, so we have these five 12 man subsets, and that's a positroid, that's actually exactly the same positroid as above. So this positroid, for example, comes from this graph. Okay, and any positroid actually comes from some graph in uh, such a way. Okay, and uh, let me give you another definition. Oh, sorry, I didn't put uh, I didn't put anything for the. I definitely don't want to put labels on that because it's not oriented correctly. And it's three four, which we're not supposed to have. Oh, so.
something is wrong. All right, so this is a wrong picture, and it gives a wrong subset. So let me fix it. Uh, so this is white, black. So we want, basically, I want to take the middle edge oriented in a different way. They should be out, out, in, in. So it should be one, two. Okay, corresponds to one, two. Right, and then we have one, two in that positroid. Okay. So, uh, so it has five elements, and uh, that's exactly a positroid. Okay, we need one more definition. We define strands alpha in graph G. So these strands are going to be some directed paths inside of this graph, whose like some walks along the edge of this graph whose direction has nothing to do with the errors that I've drawn here. Let me actually erase all these errors because I don't want to fix any perfect orientations. I want to just consider unoriented. That was just an example. So I'm going to erase all these errors so I don't confuse you. Okay, so we have this undirected graph and uh, we, we want to look at some walks uh, that, either, uh, that satisfy the following rules of the road. You can think about these uh, vertices as uh, rotaries. That's a system of roads and rotaries. And you know, like then you use GPS, GPS, then you go to a rotary, it says take, I don't know, the second exit from the rotary. So this helicity will be the exits that we need to take. So uh, that means that you're going to start somewhere on the boundary, maybe here. And you arrive here, you see number two, that means that you need to go clockwise and you take the second exit clockwise. Like go kind of here. Then it's number two again, that means that you're taking second exit. Well, let me show, like go clockwise and take the second exit. Then this is number one, that you take the first exit clockwise, you go here. This is number two, you take the second exit clockwise. You go here, you take the first exit clockwise. You come here, you, get, you take the third exit clockwise. And here you kind of finish. You start at this boundary vertex, you kind of went around and finish. So it's exactly like Rory, except that I think we go clockwise in the uh, United States, you're supposed to go counterclockwise on the road here. <laughs> I think that's, I don't, know, I don't know, but England, in Great Britain, do they go clockwise in, on rotaries? Does anybody know? Roundabout. Around about, right, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only difference. But basically, these helices are just the axes that you need to take. And there are many strands like this. That's one strand. Maybe let me just sh show another one. You start here. You go second exit, second exit, uh, second exit, and you finish. OK? So, so you have these kind of strands. And uh, now, and sometimes these strands can even be like closed curves. You can start somewhere and you just kind of go like around it and then kind of loop around in infinitely long. So, or they either, they're either closed curves or they end and start on the boundary. Okay, now let me give you another key definition. So we say that the graph is reduced So that's, so G is reduced, and if you know about reduced decomposition, well, you should know because I mentioned them in the first lecture, like reduced decomposition of permutations, they're kind of reduced in the same sense, kind of they're going to be kind of extensions of reduced decomposition. G is reduced if it satisfies the following conditions. First, no closed strands. So any strand starts and ends on the boundary. There is no way to like go around indefinitely. So no self-intersecting strands. So we cannot strands cannot you know have a self-intersection. So we cannot have closed strands. We cannot have a self-intersecting strands. There is a one. Little exception, technical exception, 
is that we allow what is called boundary lollipops. So, so what's a boundary lollipop? If one of the boundary vertices is just connected to a single vertex, then our strand would be like this, and we allow that. Just again, the, and there are going to be like two types of boundary lollipops depending on helicity of these vertex. They are exactly going to correspond to two types of fixed points. Uh, okay, so we, but otherwise we don't have any self intersect uh, strands and no bad double crossings. No bad double crossings. So it means that we are, we are not allow a pair of different strands that have two points, two intersecting points, and both are directed. Uh, okay, so this is a bad double crossing. So we don't allow a situation like this. Uh, for example, this is not a reduced graph because it does have a bad double crossing. So that's this pair of strands. They have a two common points, and they are both directed from first point to the other. Right, they are directed from here to here. If they are directed in opposite ways, that is fine. We allow that. We allow double crossings, then they kind of go in the opposite directions. But we disallow a situation like this. So this is not a reduced graph. OK? So if this doesn't happen, then we call graph reduced. OK. And uh, finally, uh, we are going to define the decorated permutation of a reduced graph. So basically, it's the permutation given by these strands. It tells you how strands, where they go. So so now the definition is decorated strand permutation W so that's a permutation of size n of graph so it's equal W of G uh, such that WI equals to J if the strand starting at uh, bi ends at bj. And where decorations are coming from, again, we have fixed points. So wi equals to i, they correspond to these boundary lollipops. Uh, you know, the, the curve of this situation there, the boundary vertex is connected just to a single vertex. We have these boundary lollipops. And again, there are two possible helicities. Helicity of this vertex can be either 0 and 1. So this is V. H of V equal, belongs to 0 or 1. So, and depending on whether it's 0 or 1, we kind of color these fixed points either by 0 or 1. And I'm pretty sure you don't want to allow zero or degree of for the non lollipop. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, did I say, yeah, there is a, did I, no, but, yeah, well, I mean, they, it's already a follow. So if we have a vertex of degree zero, yeah. so if we have a vertex whose degree equals to zero, I mean, whose helix equals to zero or the degree, yeah. then you would actually get a situation like this. Okay. And we say they, we, we get a self-intersecting strand. Would it be self-intersecting? I mean, I mean, we'll get a strand. I mean, it will, you know, have a vertex of helicity. Okay. So if you have a vertex of helicity zero, that means that you have a strand that comes from here and it kind of takes zeros oh. exit. So it kind of goes back. Okay. I kind of count it as a self-intersecting strand. And again, we only situation where it happens is. At, at boundary lollipops. Well, you can add this condition, right? So, but kind of, I think it's kind of already included in these no close trends. Okay. Finally, we are going to say, so sorry for a lot of definitions. I think I'm going to, you know, give all the definitions and then start 
from Leydian theorems. So we say that G is uh, a complete reduced uh, graph of type Kn. Why is it 0, 1? I think it's 0, n. Okay, because the helicity, as I said, helicity is between 0 and degree of the vertex. Mm -hmm. So if it's uh, like kind of... But it can be other degree. It can be what? This vertex can have other degrees. No, if it has other degrees, then it's uh, not fixed points. So, right, so according to this rule, oh. number 1, in a reduced graph, uh, I mean, if it has other degree, then it is impossible for this train to start here and come back to the same vertex. Right, so we are talking only about fixed points. We are talking about the situation where this strand starts at i vertex and ends at i vertex. And the only possibility where we have it can happen if, if this vertex is just kind of disconnected from everything else. I mean, if bi is just connected to a single vertex and there is not, like, no other way to go, so have a, it should be vertex of degree 1, like a leaf. So boundary leaf. Okay, finally we say that this is a reduced, a complete graph if uh, it is, its permutation uh, uh, is given by the following formula. It sends i to i plus k modular n. So then they say that this graph is a complete reduced graph. Okay, so in a sense, uh, so as we will see, all Reduced graphs give you parameterization of positroids. Well, they correspond to positroids and actually parameterize these positroids in the way how I'll describe a little bit later. And this complete reduced graph parameterizes the top cell, the kind of the whole positive Grassmannian. Not the lower dimensional cells, but the top. So uh, that's exactly the graphs which are reduced and whose permutation is given by this formula. So let me give you a few examples of complete graphs. So let me give you complete graphs of type. So for example, this, just a single vertex of helicity 1, is a, so it's a kind of strength permutation is this one. It sends everything, it's add i, like shift sends b1 to b2, b2 to b3, b3 to b1. It has type complete of type 1 free. Or if you have a, one, one four-valent vertex, the helicity one, it's also kind of the permutation goes like this. So it's type one four. And also if you have a pair of trivalent vertices, uh, you can also see that the permutation has this form. So it has, it's also type one four. Okay. And, uh, I don't know, if you have one, you know, like BMW vertex, or vertex of helicity 2, uh, then uh, this strand goes to here, this strand goes to here, and so on, so it has type 2, 4. And another graph of type 2, 4 is actually this uh, graph with four vertices. Black, white, well, white, black. These two guys are also have type 2, 4. Okay, so just, so all of these are complete graphs. They, all of them correspond, will correspond to the top cell. And uh, the positroid will be the whole set anxious k for all these graphs. Okay. So I have a few more minutes, so let me, finally, I'm going to define some partial order on Grassmannian graphs. So uh, we call it refinement ordering on Grassmannian graphs as follows. So let me raise this example. 
So we're going to partially order all grass money and grass as follows. Oh, so refinement. So what's the refinement ordering? It is generated by the following covering relation. Uh, replace a vorex of degree deg of v and helicity, well, degree equals to d and helicity equals to h by a complete uh, graph of type uh, hd. Okay? So let me show you a few examples of refinement orderings. So for example, just looking at these examples, if you have one white vortex of degree 4, one vortex of helicity 1, you can refine it as follows. You can replace this white vortex by a complete graph with two trivalent vertices. Okay, that's a complete graph, that's, you know, that's this graph. So, and that's the covering relation. You can re refine it like this, that's one covering relation, or you can refine it in a different way. You can kind of split it into two trivalent vertices in a different way like this. Okay, so that's, these are two covering relations. Or you can, again, think about this is just a vertex of some large graph, so you can do with this vertex, kind of this splitting operation, and you can do the same for two, for a vertex of helicity uh, free. So for the black vertex, we can split it in two possible ways, into two. Right, yeah, that's yeah, everything covered, I mean, trivially. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, right, in a partial order, any element is less unequal than itself. Yeah, so, but, uh, or you can split it like this. Okay. Finally, let me give you one more less interesting case of refinement. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's a, sorry, typo, that's H of the vertex. Yeah, right. So you replace, again, you kind of replace vertex by the complete graph. So again, again as we will see later in the next lecture, this graph represents some gluing, some way to glue large grass manions out of little grass manions. All these words represent little grass manions uh, uh, of, of grass manions HD, where H is the helicity and D is the degree of the vertex. So, and we want to kind of replace a vertex by, you know, uh, any other graph. And uh, finally, if we have this kind of vertex of helicity 2, we can refine it, refine it again in two different ways like this, that's one way to refine it, and uh, we can refine it uh, by black, white, white, black, or by these squares. And as you see in all these examples, there are exactly two ways to refine things. Okay, finally, I have, uh, I don't know how many, five minutes, a few minutes left. So let me, let me, uh, so, 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 okay, let me tell you the analogy and then I'll, I'll just formulate the theorem. So the analogy that I'm trying to make it that this is the structure of this refined order is very similar to the structure of the faces of a polytope. And this refinement is a kind of how one face, high dimensional face, cover, contain a smaller dimensional faces. Now, plebeographs 
are the minimal elements in these posets. So they are graphs that cannot be refined. So they are graphs where all vertices are already trivalent, you cannot refine them further, so they correspond to vertices of the polytope. So again, this refinement ordering is the uh, you know, ordering of faces. Finally, we can define moves, moves, moves of plebeographs. So moves of the plebeographs, two plebeographs, two minimal elements of this faucet, so two graphs which cannot be further refined, are connected by a move if they are covered by the same element. So in particular, we have each of these three types of current relations that I showed here correspond to three types of moves. That's one move, that's move of type 1, 4, he list equals to 1 and they're like, so this, uh, this is a move, another move of type 3, 4, and here we have a move of type 2, 4. So we have exactly three types of moves, and again, they are exactly comes from three types of these current relations. And again, in this analogy, if polytopes, these moves, they correspond to one skeleton of the polytope. Right, once like edges of the polytope, two vertices are connected by edges. And as we will see, I don't know if I'll have enough time today, but this is not just an analogy. In some cases, this is literally, this structure is literally the structure of certain polytope. Sometimes it's even not polytopal, but in some cases, this is literally polytope. And finally, let me just formulate the theorem, is, as we saw, like every graph, reduced graph corresponds to a positroid, but different graphs can, can correspond to the same positroid. So two graphs correspond to the same positroid if and only if they have the same permutation, two reduced graphs correspond to the same, if and only if they have the same permutation, if and only if they are equivalent in these refinement orderings, if they can be connected to each other by a sequence of refinements and coarsenings. So you start from some graph, you refine some vertices, then coarsen some vertices and go back and forth. If they can be connected to each other, they, I mean, it's kind of clear that they do refinement, you don't change the permutation, also you don't change the positroid, and that's actually if and leave. And finally, if these two graphs are minimal graphs, so in, our, in this ordering, in our, if they're plebe graphs, that is if and only if they're corresponding to moves if they kind of can be connected on this kind of skeleton of this polytope. This is only for reduced graphs. Yeah, for reduced, yeah, this is yeah, true only for reduced graphs. I mean, this refined ordering is defined for all graphs, but if graphs are reduced, then same positroid means that same permutation, that means that they are connected by these refinements and constraints, means that they are connected by moves. All these three things are completely equivalent to each other. Okay, and yeah. Thank you.